One cannot film a simple story about the Canada goose because there are 11 living races of this spectacular bird. Each has its own nesting grounds, flyways, and wintering grounds spanning the North American continent. And each has its own problems. These birds can be separated into groups by size. Four large geese, four races of medium-sized geese, and three races of small ones. Missouri claims four of these. The giant Canada, or Maxima goose, is the only race both nesting and wintering in Missouri. Wild birds weigh between 10 and 18 pounds. Todd's, or the interior Canada, weighs between 6 and 11 pounds. The lesser Canada weighs between 4 and 8 pounds. And the Richardson's Canada goose weighs from 3 to 7 pounds. The most numerous in Missouri by far, and the most often bagged by hunters, is the Todd's, or Interior Canada. We know this bird mostly on its wintering grounds here in Missouri. Only in recent years have the nesting regions of Missouri's birds and their migration pattern been documented. This is its story. been moved by the sight of wild fowl. The Canada goose has come to represent all that is noble in the wild, free world of birds. Artists have been challenged by their grace and spirit to pluck them from the sky and leave their impressions on canvas. And photographers, too, have been challenged to freeze their flight into permanent records. To generations of men closely attuned to nature's clock, the wild chorus of migrant birds has heralded the changing season. For citizens of all ages, the sights and sounds of wild flocks are a tonic from the pressure of modern life. On the Arctic tundra, geese have always been a part of the Eskimos world. The Eskimos' long winter's monotonous diet of seal, dried caribou, and fish is varied by the addition of goose eggs. With crude but effective decoys hacked from spruce logs, geese were once lured into arrow range by Canadian Crees. Hunting Niska, the goose, was a necessary way of life. But their needs placed no critical demands on the bird. Today's Indians still hunt geese for food but more and more use their traditions and skills to guide modern sportsmen. Along the flyways and on the wintering grounds to the south, the 
Vast migrant flocks meant an inexhaustible supply to early wildfowlers who showed little concern for the future. But another generation of wildfowlers, inheriting the dwindling resource, found new values. They replaced quantity with quality. Hunting became a ritual, and the Canada goose was considered the standard of all game birds. The skills of properly placing the decoys and calling wild birds still carry on the tradition of quality. Hunting is an important ingredient in the economics of today's leisure time. But where men and geese concentrate, the problems of managing a goose flock can be very complicated. Although our Canada geese are not now threatened, conservation departments are concerned about their welfare. From north to south, Canadian and American conservation agencies are providing a system of refuges where protection, lodging and food are helping these international travelers. Special taxes and license fees paid by hunters have largely supported this whole program. These conservation efforts have been working well but demands of today's society cause some things to loom on the horizon that may spell trouble for geese. Exploitation of fuels and other minerals threatens their Arctic home. Continued drainage of marshes and wetlands, for whatever cause, further deprives these birds of places they need. These man-made problems must be considered by today's biologist, who also has the task of gleaning facts about the bird's life history. Ultimately, he must weave this knowledge into a fabric of honest understanding and cooperative management between the various United States and provinces of Canada, so that with each spring and autumn, there will always be a wild chorus. This wild chorus has its beginning as past flowers mark the advent of spring on the Canadian prairie. Into this vast expanse of wheatland, marsh, and water, Canada geese return from their southern wintering grounds. The population of geese that winters in Missouri selects southern Manitoba for its spring staging area. Here, in late April, against a backdrop of grain elevators, they gather and wait. These birds are in good physical condition following their winter sojourn in the Corn Belt to the south, but they must maintain energy reserves for their final push of almost a thousand miles north to their nesting ground. Opportunist, they probe underwater for seeds and plant growth. Geese are highly social birds, but at times, a tension builds up from too much closeness. This tension is released by a ritualized bathing. Once initiated, Bathing spreads spontaneously throughout the group. Male and female Canada geese have similar plumage. 
Following any form of bathing, great care is devoted to straightening and waterproofing the feathers. An aggressive male wards off a competitor. Then he reassures his mate. A display precedes mating. Pairs usually remain mated from year to year, but sometimes new mates are selected. Finally, the time arrives. Early in May, flock after flock leave the staging area and head north. This is an act of faith, based on generations of experience, because there is only a promise of spring to come. They are returning home to the west coast of Hudson Bay, where they were hatched and raised. It's a bleak homecoming in the land of wind-sculptured trees and snow. Last summer's frozen crowberries now replace corn and wheat in the diet. An Indian dog team returns from a seal hunt on the frozen bay. Unsuccessful in their quest for seals, the Indians would settle for a goose instead. The landscape may be winters, but ptarmigan, which have survived temperatures of 40 degrees below zero, are already molting their winter's white to summer's gone. The arctic fox is still attired for snow. A collared lemming, a small rodent that has wintered beneath the snow, and caribou, will find food more available now. As fast as the heavy snows thaw and open water forms, other waterfowl arrive from the south. Pintails. Shovelers. Whistling swans and skeins of snow and blue geese. Sandhill cranes move north too. Mated pairs of Canada geese are now intolerant of other pairs and the cohesion of the flock breaks down. Between the northern spruce forest and the open tundra lies a transition zone of muskeg a boggy region of stunted spruce 
and tamarack trees with an understory of sedges, mosses, and fragrant Labrador tea. Tiny primitive horsetail grows here too. And colorful coltsfoot borders melting snow pools where awakening chorus frogs join wood frogs in singing. The wood frog lives further north than any other amphibian. A yellow legs defends its nesting territory from a tamarack perch. Beyond this continental tree line is the tundra, underlain by a permanent sheet of ice, the permafrost. In the tundra pools, northern phalaropes find tiny aquatic animal life to feed upon. Mosses, lichens, sedges, and a few hardy flowering plants form a thick spongy mat on this windswept, nearly treeless expanse. In places, stunted arctic willows grow in dense thickets. Tradition plays a large part in the Canada goose's life. After an absence of nearly nine months, each pair returns to the same area where it nested in previous years and selects a nest site. Nesting pairs are intolerant of other mated pairs. Because of this, the nesting grounds cover a wide area. Not infrequently, an odd female attaches herself to a mated pair and accompanies them in their quest for a nesting spot. But by the time nesting is underway, only pairs will be seen together. This female has chosen the concealing shelter of a muskeg thicket for her nest. She has five eggs, an average clutch. Down plucked from the female's breast forms an insulating blanket. Geese nest on the tundra too, seeking drier places like pressure ridges or small islands. The bulk of the population begins to nest within a phenomenally short period of about 10 days in mid-May. Snowstorms are not uncommon, even at this time. If the storm doesn't last too long and the female stays on her nest, the embryos will survive. But one year out of three, the storms are catastrophic. This means fewer birds to fly south, and two years later, fewer birds to nest. Now the Arctic tundra becomes a huge incubator. The female ptarmigan, in her brown summer plumage, conceals her already camouflaged eggs. Just back from the Gulf of Mexico, the semi-palmated plover sits calmly on her nest. At the mouths of major rivers emptying into Hudson Bay, snow and blue geese form nesting colonies. Snow and blue geese are two color phases of the same species. In this setting, Arctic loons nest in close harmony with snow geese. Ill-equipped for travel on land, they nest close to the water's edge. Unlike Canada geese, 
nesting snow geese tolerate other nests nearby, even their own kind. The common eider is a hardy year-round resident. The drab female lines her nest with down, famous for its insulating qualities. The parasitic Jaeger is a hunter, mostly of eggs, baby birds, and lemmings. In the northern phalaropes world, domestic duties are reversed. The eggs are left for the less colorful male to incubate. In a land where ice reigns most of the year, spring and summer are short. The breakup of ice on Hudson Bay signifies the beginning of summer. The Arctic in summer is bejeweled with color. Indian paintbrush splatters the landscape. Myriads of wild flowers, like Dryas, a small member of the rose family and purple saxifrage. All make a colorful backdrop for a nest of Lapland longsbirds and least sandpipers. The golden plover, as colorful as the tundra, and the Hudsonian curlew, or wimbrel, winter in Argentina, but call this country their summer home. Arctic terns are phenomenal travelers. Some fly a 22,000 mile round trip between nesting grounds here and wintering grounds in the southern hemisphere. A stately polar bear, fresh from hunting seals on pack ice of the bay, brings her cubs ashore to rest. This incredible mammal, now an endangered species, is symbolic of the Arctic. Immense, strong, yet vulnerable. Arctic life has only a brief time to fulfill its destiny. In this remote country, the season of reproduction of both plants and animals is telescoped into a few brief weeks. Because of this critical timetable, any unusual weather or disturbance by man can put this delicate mechanism out of adjustment and drastically influence all plant and animal species sojourning here. Because Canada geese all started to nest about the same time, hatching is synchronous. For nearly a month while the female incubated her eggs, the male maintained a vigil nearby. Once the eggs hatch and the downy goslings dry, they are ready to leave the nest. The young learn to know their parents 
and strong family bonds develop. Early in life, they also acquire an attachment for the area where they were hatched. Next spring, they will accompany their parents back to this home. The first two weeks after hatching are critical for survival of the goslings. Prolonged cold spells with wet, foggy weather, typical of the Hudson Bay coast, may chill the youngsters and require constant brooding. Low temperatures may reduce the tiny aquatic forms of life and the new green growth which they feed upon. This is also the period when the threat of predation is greatest. From Jaegers, Arctic foxes now in their mottled summer coats, and herring gulls. Losses from any cause right after hatching are serious because there is no chance for a second brood in this harsh country. Usually, only two or three young per pair survive to make the trip south. The long daylight hours of the northern summer accelerate the growth of grasses and sedges. The goslings grow fast too, but it takes a lot of land in the Arctic to support a family, and the geese wander widely in search of food. As they mature, the broods and their parents gradually move toward the coast. Hatching spreads to the river estuaries. A snow goose nest can have young of two colors, dark and light. These goslings will grow up to resemble their snow goose mother and blue goose father. Unlike geese, young horned larks will remain in the nest until they can fly. The Hudsonian godwit, whose future is precarious, broods her downy chicks in this tundra wilderness. In July, one and two-year-old geese, still too young to mate, and older birds unsuccessful in nesting, leave the nesting neighborhood and in response to some urge, head further north on old and frayed plumage. Their flight feathers have lasted for a whole year and carried them thousands of miles. There, on some lonely shoreline, they shed flight feathers and grow new ones, all in the span of about six weeks. Back on the nesting grounds, parent birds renew plumage while the young are growing theirs. About six weeks of age, white cheek patches appear the mark that distinguishes the Canada goose from all other species of geese. The solitude of the Arctic wilderness is broken by man's intrusion. vantage point, he 
scans the tundra wetlands like a huge predator. A bull moose retreats with comic dignity. A cow and her calf are alarmed too. But in another pool, a pair of molting swans remains calm. Man is hunting a special kind of game. His quarry is rafts of geese, young broods and their molting parents. A team of waterfowl biologists from Canada and the United States is cooperating to band these Canada geese on their nesting ground. Once the geese are sighted, a portable trap is set up at a strategic site. Helicopters skillfully herd the flightless geese. The efficient ground crew takes only a few minutes to set up the trap. Fleeing from the helicopter, the geese take to the shore and rush unknowingly into the open wings of the trap. Coordination between air and ground crews pays off. At the precise moment, the trap is shut. But the successful drive is only part of the task. There's a lot of information that must be obtained. Adult birds are weighed and measured for racial characteristics. All birds are sexed and banded. Banding tells us where the birds nest and where they winter and how long they live. We know that one of our females lived at least 22 years in the wild. Most of these geese, however, seldom live longer than seven years. They don't make a repellent strong enough to discourage tundra mosquitoes. In a few weeks, these goslings will have grown their flight feathers and will be on the wing. In family groups, they will leave their summer home for the long trek southward. When the first flocks arrive in Missouri in late September, summer's green still dominates the landscape. Late summer and early autumn rains may create flood conditions, and standing crops, like this milo, are attractive feeding areas for hungry northern appetites wetted by the long flight. more arrivals. By mid-October, the bulk of the fall flight
has arrived in Missouri. Geese are grazing animals, and the flocks, still made up of family groups, feed together. Beside food, big fields and open pastures offer geese space. Space to separate family groups and to give them a feeling of security. Refuges provide much of this space so important to geese. With winter, the seasonal needs of Canada geese change. High energy foods, like corn, become essential, and geese concentrate where waste grain is available in harvested fields. By now, weather conditions have pushed most migrant geese out of the northern states, and numbers build up in Missouri. Thousands in one field are not uncommon. This is the time when many people appreciate the spectacle these great birds provide as the flocks wheel across the sky and scatter over the frozen fields. When the mercury dips below 15 degrees Fahrenheit, Canada geese are reluctant to fly. If well fed and not disturbed, geese can serve body heat within their insulation of heavy down. They may wait out freezing winds and bitter cold for several days without ill effects. Periodic counts are made by biologists during the fall and winter months. From these and other inventories, an evaluation is made of the harvest during the hunting season and survival on the wintering grounds. The flock that winters in Missouri may exceed 200,000 birds in peak years, and carefully controlled hunting is permitted. The bald eagle, one of the few predators on adult geese, is attracted to big winter concentrations. The geese fear the eagle, but seldom does he catch a healthy bird. Mostly he calls the weak and crippled from the flock. Down the flyways and on the wintering grounds, concentrations of Canada geese are mostly within the zone of man's influence. Here, man has changed the very face of the earth, sometimes to the benefit and sometimes to the detriment of geese. 
But the vast nesting grounds, lying far to the north along Henry Hudson's Bay, are to date largely undisturbed wilderness and the home of myriads of wild species. The immensity of this Arctic land stuns the imagination, yet even its vast and inhospitable character will not save it from exploitation by modern society. This fragile wilderness is the vital link in the continental chain that is survival or extinction for our geese. Only if we can protect the integrity of the Arctic nesting grounds Will our hearts still be lifted by the great flights of Canada geese and their wild chorus?